will not fail at all. We want to thank you, God, that we build our house upon the rock with you, Jesus, as our foundation of God. And therefore, we will not be moved. For I have set the Lord at my right hand, and therefore, I will not be moved. Yes, Jesus, we're going to praise you, God, from where we are standing right now. We want to look to you, Jesus, this morning. We want to cast our cares upon you, God. We want to worship you freely, Jesus. We want to thank you, God, that we are in the palm of your hand. And nothing and no one can snatch us away. We want to thank you, Jesus, that we are the beloved of God. That you look upon us, Jesus, and simply love us and love us and love us. And with that knowledge, we come into your presence today and just worship you. Yes, Lord, we sing, Jesus.
your name on high, Lord. You are worthy of all your praise, Jesus. You are worthy of all our worship, Lord. No detail, no anxiety, no worry is worthy of our thoughts, God, but you alone, God. You alone, Jesus, are worthy of all our worship, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the difference the cross has made in our lives, God. We stand here, Lord, on even ground because of the cross, God. Thank you, Jesus, for the cross, God. Thank you that because of the cross, Lord, no weapon formed by Satan and his principalities and powers can stand against us. But because of the cross, Jesus, thank you because of the cross, Lord, no tongue of condemnation can stand against us. No accusation can stand against us, Lord. That is our heritage, Lord, as children of God. Thank you, Jesus, for the cross. Thank you so much for the cross, Lord. We lift you up, Lord. We thank you for the cross. You overcame the grave And you're alive in me today And 
there is only one. Thank you, Lord. There is no other God besides our God. Amen. There is no other Prince of Peace, no other Wonderful Counselor, no other Everlasting Father. Like your God. Thank you, Jesus. Minister to us a God this morning as we continue to worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
let my life outweigh my songs. Unbroken praise be Revelations chapter 2. It's uh, yeah, tomorrow. Pastor Shivali reaches Nepal. And uh, you know, it's amazing that he can be here just to make sure that he is here from the Mumbai church. Four men are going there. <laughs> Pastor Fred is already there. And tomorrow, Pastor John, Pastor Shekhar, and Pastor Pino go. So, and they will bring him here. So, thank you for that. It's a great time, right? So, Revelation chapter 2, and verses 8 to 11. And this is uh, the message to the church. Smarna, uh, out of the seven churches that we hear in Revelation 2 and 3, only two, the Lord has no words of rebuke. One is Smarna, the other one is Philadelphia. And uh, we will see those <coughs> in a short moment. So, the message that the Lord has for this church. Let's, let's just stand. We just read this few verses quickly. And uh, this. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, The first and the last who was dead and who has come to life says this, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not, but a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested. And you will have tribulation for ten days. Be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. He who has a ear, let him hear what the Spirit has to say to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. So Father, we thank you this morning. Thank you for the worship. Thank you for every aspect and for ministering to us. Thank you for the times of prayer for our pastor, Lord, and his family. And Lord, we pray that as we continue to hold him in prayer, God, that we will see and witness what you and you alone can do, God. And we pray for the conference coming up, for the missionaries as they travel, God. We pray that provide, protect them. And God, speak to us, God, as you always do. And give us a great conference ahead. And this morning also, Lord, Minister to each one of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let me see it. Uh, Smyrna, the place today is in Turkey called Izmir. And uh, this was a place known for uh, Caesar worship. They had a competition in those days in 1826, and Smyrna won the rights to build a statue and uh, publicly declare that Caesar is Lord. And uh, no Christian would do that. But in this city, this was the background. Uh, Smyrna was also very a popular place, a port city. The reason why was they were known for this ingredient called myrrh. And, uh, you know, it speaks of death. We know that myrrh is used in many places and we, we have the application of that. But uh, when, this, when the leaves of this plant are crushed, then it gives a fragrant smell. And so that's why it was very popular. It was one of those... Uh, you know, flourishing towns, but the Christians in those places in Smyrna were not well to do because of their faith. They stood firm on their faith. They would not bow down to Caesar. They would not say Caesar is Lord. And so they were persecuted. And to them, this message Jesus gives. To them, Christ speaks. And there is no rebuke, but there is, but there is encouragement, there is hope. And we draw uh, some aspects from that for our personal lives too. And we can see that in you know, Smyrna would be uh, a place that was persecuted, but also that received a great commendation from the Lord. And he begins by saying that in verse 8, the first and the last who was dead and has come back to, and who has come to life. And Jesus is beginning to encourage them. And Jesus is beginning to tell these people, okay, you are going through a tough situation. You are going to face further persecution. But understand who is speaking to you. And he says the first and the last. And he, he gives those extremes, the first and the last, to show that he is the one who is in control of everything. He is the beginning and he is the end. 
Everything starts and ends with him in the picture. There is nothing that is beyond his control. And so he begins to encourage the church and says, is the first and the last. And then he says, who was dead and has come to life. And the reason why he says that is because he knows what they are facing. And he wants the people to know that what they are facing, he has already faced it. Whatever situation could ever come in their life, he has already gone through it. And he has come out victorious of it. So he's telling the church that, listen, I have faced it. I was hated, I was persecuted, I was mocked, I was beaten, I was crucified. But I'm alive. So nothing can finish you. I am the one who's going to bring you back. And 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, we remember this verse where it says, Thanks be to God who always leads us into victory, into triumph in Christ Jesus. And that's what he's saying to the church there, that no matter what you go through, in the, in the earlier days, you know, before men began to sail in ships and uh, they had maps, but those maps were not like the maps we have today. Uh, there were few places that people had visited, had met, and so those maps would have places where people had sailed and found something, a name was given. But wherever they had sailed, not, people had not gone, they would mark in that map and write, here be dragon. Which means, you don't know who's there. No one's reached there. So they would mark it and say, here be dragon. And you know what this, what is Jesus saying here is like, if you are going through a place, if you don't know what's coming next, in your life, in your book, you write, here is Jesus. Because he's been there and he's already there. There is no situation that is new for him. There is no situation that surprises him. There is no circumstances that comes across which he has not encountered. And he says in, in the life, in the book of our life, if something we are not aware of, he says, you write, here is Jesus. Because he's already there. He knows it. And he begins to encourage them. And he says to them, in verse 9, he says, I know. And you know, if you can stop there, and if you think of that, those two words, isn't, isn't that something that is enough for us sometimes? That Jesus knows. And then you can add what you want to add. But just those two words, I know. That's it. Jesus says, I know what happened in the past, what's happening now, and what's going to happen in the future. I know. I am the first and the last. The one who was dead, but now who's alive. And I know it all. And you can say, it's him. Jesus is here. But what does he know? And here he's talking to them and he says, I know your trouble. Isn't that beautiful that Jesus knows it? Like I can talk to people, I can have people pray, I, I, we can pray in our families, in our church, as a body we do, and we experience that. But more than anything else, in this, by looking at this verse, when Jesus says, I know, then it's the one who's going to give the answer, the one who's going to rescue us, the one who's going to provide the answer, the one who's going to open the door, the one who's going to bring the healing, the one who's going to take care of all the needs, that one is saying, I know your troubles. You know, many may not know, but I am aware. You may think I am not aware, but Jesus is saying here, I am aware, I know them. By the way, the word here, affliction, does not mean like a small trouble, like you lost your wallet or you can't find some book or something. It means severe pressure. It's like the word picture here is, it is a man, and on top of a man, you put like a large stone. It's crushing him. He's saying, I know those situations too. And that's the word affliction that he uses here. I know those pressing needs. I know those troubles. And then he tells them, I know your poverty also. Like in the areas where you're poor. Because in Smyrna, what would happen is, if a Christian was not saying, Jesus is Lord, uh, like Caesar is Lord, then they would be thrown out of their offices or their houses would be robbed and publicly they would be mocked and so they would have very little with them and Jesus is saying yes you have very little with you but I'm aware of that also 
I'm aware of what is pressing you from all sides, but I'm also aware of your poverty. I'm aware of the persecution that you go. But he then he says them, but you are rich. And what Christ is saying here is, it's not the material or the materialistic needs or the things that you have that show or we are measuring your life in. It's the spiritual aspect. And what he's saying to them is, you are maybe poor, but you are pure. You are pure. You, you love me, you stand for me, you witness for me. You not only worship, but you also witness. You are pure. And in my eyes, you are rich. In the world's eyes, you may have nothing, but in my eyes, Christ says, you are rich. And you know, that's, that's, the, that's the believer's life. We may, we may lack, we may not have, but in our hearts, we are rich because we know the Lord. And when we worship Him, we are basically saying, this is who you are, God. Like, I have nothing, but I have joy on my face. I, am, I, have, I don't have the things that I want. There are things that are needs that I are lacking. But I have peace. People look at our faces and they say, I mean, you should not have this smile on your face. But you do. It transcends everything, that peace. You know. Then he also says, and I know your enemies. And that's like good. Like he says, I know your circumstances, I know your needs, but I also know those who are against you, those who are coming against you. And he says, these are Jews, but they are not, but a synagogue of Satan. Like they are out there to take, take you apart. They are out there coming at you. If what was going on in your life is not enough, you have some enemies too. And Jesus says, I know. I know them and I can handle them. And what is Christ saying? He's saying, you live your faith in these moments. You live by faith. You know, you pray, these things are going on, but I know your enemies. Because God does not take lightly when his children are attacked. Remember Acts chapter 9? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He didn't say the church. He said, why are you persecuting me? And so when something comes against the child of God, and God doesn't take it lightly. Yesterday when we were praying, and we were at this time of prayer, and in the end, Pastor said, you know what, this is times when, when God says to the devil, back off. They are my child. This one's my child. And that's like a privilege for us. Like we know that we have an enemy, but then we know that we have a God who knows the enemy, and he can take care of him. And the book of Job is that story. The book of Job is that story that there is an enemy who is attacking, there is a thing is going wrong, but then there is God in Job 42 who doubles everything. And this is like our lives. This is like we, we, we think about, like the Lord knows, the Lord knows all those things in my life, but what is he going to do at the end? And he's saying, live by faith. You will see what I will do at the end. And then he says to them something which is we all love to hear. He says, fear not in verse number 10. Do not fear. We talk about this 366 times this word, this phrase comes in the Bible. Even for the leap year it's there. Do not fear. One for every day. Do not fear. What you're about to suffer before. Behold the devil is about to cast some of you into prison. And by the way when, when he says cast some of you into prison, in those days prison did not mean that you would be there for some time. It means you are there for a little while and then execution. You will be thrown to the lions or some form of execution. And he says, you know, do not fear. He is going to do this. And what I was reading and I was thinking is that God knows the future. And before that can happen or anything can come in our lives, he says, do not fear. Because it's not surprising me. I am allowing this. This may happen for a little while, but it's limited. And he says that 10 days, it's limited. <laughs> And once those 10 days is over, the trial of your faith, once it's over, then he says, I will give you the crown of life. I will give you the crown of life. The, the word crown there does not mean the king's crown, it means the victor's crown. Like someone runs in Olympics and wins and comes first, so that they would give that crown to the victorious person called Stephanos. And he says, that's the victor's crown I will give you. 
And in James, we were talking this, we were teaching this in the class. We said in James chapter 1, verse 5, he says, When you go through these trials, ask God for wisdom. And this is one prayer that God will never say no to. He says, When you ask wisdom, ask God for wisdom, it's a command, it's not a request. It's, it's the James chapter 1, verse 5 is when you go through trials, ask for wisdom. It's not like, please ask, it means you, you better ask, Christian. And he gives it to you without reproach. It's interesting, the word reproach, without reproach there means that he will give it to you for one reason. That's for your benefit. Without asking you what happened in the past. It's like sometimes we pray and then God tells us what to do and we don't do it. Right? Has that ever happened to anyone? You have prayed and God said, let's do this and you said, mm -hmm, I have a better plan. I have a better way. And maybe this is for next time. And this is what James says, he says, when, when you ask, then for that prayer, for wisdom in these situations, it's always a yes. It's always for your benefit and God never reminds you what happened, what you did with it in the past. So he's not going to bring up, I told you 10 times not to do this, yet you did it again. That's man. That's us. And that's what he says, without reproach. He will give it to you without reproach. He's not interested that what happened last time. He's saying now it's for your benefit. And Jesus encourages this church and says, this is going to happen. But remember, I know all of these things. I know your inner needs. I know your outer circumstances. And I know those who are coming against you. Do not fear. It's for a time. And then you will overcome. Keep your eyes focused on the first and the last. Keep your eyes focused on the one who was dead and is now alive. Because everything may seem it's over and finished. But I have the power to give life. I can bring it back to life. I can raise it back. Nothing is finished. Nothing is over when it comes. Nothing you're, you're a believer, a Christian, is never defeated. We are always on the victorious side. We just don't have the realization sometimes. But we are always on the victorious side. It's because our Lord is risen. And He says to them, He says, Do not fear. Ask for wisdom. And God will give it to you. And then He says in the last one, He says, Be faithful unto death. And that's, that's, that's our life. Be faithful unto death. Keep your eyes on the faithful one. And you remain faithful all your life. And in the end, you will see the victory of the Lord in our life. You will experience the victory in your own life. You know, in closing, we I'll just talk about <coughs> uh, Polycarp. And uh, he was the first bishop of the Church of Smyrna in 8155. And, uh, you know, he was asked to renounce... Christianity renounced Christ and publicly accept Caesar. And he said, I won't do it. So his church said, please go and hide. And he said, I won't go and hide. And then one day in night, while sleeping, he had a dream. And the pillow on which he was sleeping began to burn. And he realized, like that's how he's going to go. And he realized, I'm going to be burned at the stake. And so the people of the church said, please go. And he said, I won't go. But they, but they took him. And uh, you know, they hid him in a friend's home, far out in the country. And the police began to search for him, they couldn't find him, so they, they caught the members of the church and they persecuted one guy so badly that he eventually told them where he was. So these cops went to catch hold of Polycarp and brought him out and he was a frail old man. He was 86 at that time. And uh, on the way they are bringing him back and they are saying, hey, just once. Just once, just say, you know, Caesar is Lord. And he would say no. And they felt bad for him. He says, you're a, you're a, you know, your body is almost gone. You're so old. What's the matter? You know, you've done what you have to do. Just once, just say it and finish it off. Why you want to bring this trouble on yourself? And he said, I will not. So they took him in, put him in prison. And the day for execution came. There were ten men before him who had to go for that. And they brought one in the arena and they said, renounce Christ. And the first guy said, okay, I renounce Christ, Caesar is Lord. So they let him go. The next nine men said, no, we won't. So they brought the lions out. And the lions tore these men apart. And next was Polycarp. And when Polycarp walked into the Colosseum and people were screaming and shouting and they said, renounce. And he said, I will not renounce Christ. 
I said, okay, we put you to that. They bought the lions, the lions were already full, so they did not, you know, they didn't want him. So they put a, they put sticks together, they put a wooden pole, and they tied him to the pole and put oil all around him. And they burned him. And while they were burning him, this man said, Lord, it's been a privilege to serve you. And forgive these men for what they are doing. Forgive these men for what they are doing. And he's the, he's the pastor of the same church to whom these words were written. The church of Smyrna. And he said, for 86 years of my life, he has been faithful. How can I forsake him? How can I just give up on him? I will remain faithful to the end. And this is like for us when we think situations on the outside, pressures on the inside. We have no idea what's going on. God says, do not fear. I know it all. You remain faithful. And you will see the victory in the end. Amen. Amen. So stand for the reading of God's word. Second Samuel chapter 24. Second Samuel chapter 24, verse 1 to 4. And then verse 8 and 9. Again, the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel and he moved David against them to say go number Israel and Judah verse 2 so the king said to Joab the commander of the army who was with him now go throughout all the tribes of Israel from Dan to Beersheba and count the people that I may know the number of the people and Job said to the king now may the Lord your God add to the people a hundred times more than there are. And may the eyes of my Lord the King see it. But why does my Lord the King desire this thing? Verse 4. Nevertheless the King's word prevailed against Job and against the captains of the army. Therefore Job and the captains of the army went out from the presence of the King to count the people of Israel. Verse 8, when they had gone throughout all the land, they came to Jerusalem at the end of nine months and twenty days. And Job gave the sum of the number of the people to the king. And there were in Israel 800,000 valiant men who drew the sword. And the men of Judah were 500,000 men. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, already we had a great morning worshipping you and uh, hearing from you from different men. Uh, Father, we ask you to feed us this morning. Continue to feed us, Lord, and uh, we ask you to bless our word and anoint the word and uh, really encourage us, build us up, speak to us. We come in this morning into your hands in Jesus' name. Amen. Wasn't that a great morning already? Oh, yeah. Only say yes, raise your yes. body person only. <laughs> okay. No, it was really beautiful worship. We had great worship this morning and uh, also wonderful offering message we heard. Every time he speaks, I get convicted. I give more than <laughs> I normally give. No? And so he's a good offering feature actually. And then we heard a, a beautiful testimony, very touched by the testimony of the blood transfusion. It was very encouraging. And then we heard from Pastor Atul a beautiful message. I know, fear not faithful. You know, those three things. And the last testimony shared was beautiful. And, but when he shared about the word suffering, the church was suffering and he said suffering is not losing your wallet that's not as soon as he said that I put my hand on my wallet to check to check is it there or not <laughs> okay, how so human we are like no and it's amazing okay second Samuel chapter 24 
the title of this morning's message is a misplaced confidence no a misplaced confidence uh the message is from second samuel 24 maybe you can go home and read this chapter more in detail we have not read all the details that are mentioned in this chapter but you may go home and read this chapter a beautiful chapter great lessons to uh learn uh there are this this whole chapter is in one sense uh the the main theme of this chapter is pride that uh, comes into this chapter is like the pride that came into uh david's life at one point of time and uh it's such an important subject for all of us because our title of this message is misplaced confidence what leads to like how does a believer stop trusting god is when pride comes in that leads to misplaced trust or confidence in us no so uh, this morning i i have i was uh, reading this uh, passage and i felt like every believer you know every believer uh, will be prone to three areas in our lives wherein uh, we may be prone to shift our trust from the lord and uh, and misplaced our trust in something else there are three areas uh, that we need to guard ourselves and uh, that's so important principles to learn and we'll go one by one quickly uh, but uh, we all need this message like we all need it uh, it's an important message we all can fall into pride and god hates pride and there are three areas where i will go in detail and explain what it is and and make it more practical no the first area of uh, misplaced confidence is when a believer thinks that i can stand on my own like trusting in self when a believer thinks that i can stand on my own uh, i don't need the lord i don't need the provisions that god provides to a believer that's the first uh, area of misplaced confidence in 1st corinthians chapter 10 verse 12 it says let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall right that's the first area like for me like we can say like okay i am a believer uh, pride can come into my life and i can say like i can stand like i can live my christian life uh, i can do it all alone uh, like i can live my spiritual life alone and i can do it independently i can do it in spiritual isolation that pride can come in and it's a misplaced confidence in one's self and pride leads to that and the bible says let him who thinks and we can put our name there let him put your name in brackets there who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall but what's the solution for this it's in philippians 4:13 like i can do all things through christ i can really run the christian race by when i lean on christ as my strength and i take all the provisions that god gives for a believer then i can do all things through christ who strengthens me and i take all the provisions that god gives me in my race that i needed that's amazing that's the right way of doing but thinking that i can stand is a misplaced confidence no and it's so important so god gives us like god says like you can't stand on your own like you can't live this christian life on your own you need me you need my power you need my provisions and what are the provisions god gives us uh, a believer is i've listed down some of them first provision apart from christ being our strength apart from the holy spirit god gives us the body of christ right aren't we amazing aren't you amazing yes. yes the body of christ is a provision given by christ like we all need like like one another like the body of christ is a blessing there something happens when we come to the body of christ the body of christ is an amazing provision from god like we 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 can't live this christian life without the body of christ like we get built up from from the pulpits we get built up by fellowship we get built up by worship and uh, we live 
in interdependence on one another like like we have the holy spirit we have god but also we need one another like we need one another's portion in the body and that's a provision from god to help me finish my race no that's why the bible says god didn't give all the gifts to one person because we can live in interdependence and, and really receive from one another and grow in Christ. Second uh, provision that God gives me is, uh, is the word of God. Like God gives me his word. I know we all read our Bibles at home. We have daily devotions, daily reading. But, but God also has a corporate message for us. Daily reading is there. But, but coming to church and hearing a corporate message is so important it's a provision from god now how often like we come so dry empty and we sit in the church and god builds us up and he encourages us in our race like the like we may say like pastor i know all the verses in the bible i know all the chapters in the bible for example i know second samuel chapter 24 maybe some of you may be sitting there and i know this chapter like, like I've read it many times, I know the in and out of it, I know the Greek, Hebrew of this chapter, but we miss the freshness uh, that the Holy Spirit brings when we come to church and hear from the uh, pulpit. Like we need corporate word, that's what I'm trying to say. How many think we need corporate word? Like we need, apart from reading personal, reading Bible, we need to hear from different men. And be, it's a provision from God. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together and do it all the more even as you see the day of Christ approaching. You no? Know? And uh, then uh, why am I saying that? Because we can, we can like, there, there can be moments in our life where maybe, maybe we can say like, oh, I'm a seasoned Christian. Like, no, I've been a Christian for 40 years. Uh, I've been a Christian for 50 years. I know the Bible and uh, I know in and out, uh, I've, I've got so much fruit in my life as a Christian and uh, we can say, I, I can stand, I can live this Christian life on my own, I don't need the body of Christ, I, do, I don't need the word of God and that pride can come into our life but God has given us the word of God, corporate hearing of God's word and also the body of Christ as a provision to build you up and to encourage you in your race with Christ. Now why am I saying? Because we think when we are seasoned and I don't need these provisions, then there is room for us to really fall and fail in our Christian life. Because this sin in particular, that David sinned of counting the senses, actually happened. You want to know his Christian experience? When he fell into sin, uh, Second Samuel 24 happened after David became king. Uh, it's been 38 years ever since he assumed throne and that's when he fell into the sin of counting the senses. Can you imagine that? Isn't that interesting? 38 years of being a wonderful man of God and then this temptation came and he counted the senses and he fell. Two years before he was going to the grave and 38 years after he assumed the throne he actually uh, fell into this prideful sin of counting the senses. That tells us like that how much more cautious we all have to be uh, when uh, in terms of like having uh, God's word for our lives and, and the body of Christ. You know? And the third provision that God gives us is, 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 is godly friends in the body of Christ. Like we have God above us. And then we have pastor as our covering and mentors as our coverings. And then also it's good to surround like uh, godly friends around us, spiritual friends, mature Christian friends around us. It's good to surround. It's a provision from God. And uh, we need as many people as around godly friends around us. That's, that's a provision that God gives us. And we receive from one another. And we are blessed by each other's portion. Look at David. David had God above him. David had Samuel as his mentor also. And then he also had people around him. Like he had uh, Jonathan as his friend. And uh, here in this chapter, Job was under him. But he was trying to alert him of his sin before he committed it. But he had people around him. And that's a 
blessing in our life. Like some of you might say, why do we need people around him, uh, around us? Why somebody has to tell us? Why should we be accountable to somebody? I will have a thought that like, do you, do I really need to be accountable to somebody? Like why I need people above me? Why I need people around me? Why I need people with whom I need to be accountable? Like no, that question can come to us. Because when David was even thinking of counting the census, his commander alerted David, David, why are you doing this? What's your motive behind this? And he was giving him some kind of advice. It's good to have people, accountable partners around us, friends that can build us up, edify us, but also friends that could uh, actually correct us at times. No? Why do we need accountable partners? Three reasons I have written down why I need an accountable partner is first reason is the accountable partner, spiritual people around us, mature people around us, help me to see the blind spots that I don't see in my life and the weaknesses that I don't see in my life. They can really bring it out before me and they can expose those blind spots to me. No? Second reason I need accountable partners in my life is, is because they love me and uh, they want to see the best happen in my life. They have the best interest for my life. They have the best interest for my life. Uh, first thing is they see the blind spots in my life and weaknesses that I don't see. Second is they have the best interest in my life. And the third reason I need accountable partners in my life is, is God can use my friends as a tool they can be used by God as a tool for me to progress spiritually. They can be used by God for me to progress spiritually. No? And uh, that's amazing. All of you are serious. How many of you think that we need accountable partners? Somebody like surround. Okay, the hands keep going as the message is progress. <laughs> everybody, by the end of the message, everybody is like hiding under the seat. <laughs> No, it's getting intense. But I want to tell you that it's it's not a message to condemn. It's just stay on. It's a message that builds you. But we all need. In my life, I had many people that, that did correct me in many uh, stages of my life. And uh, I did have people around me. And I took those instructions. They helped me. Things that I didn't see. And sometimes, initially, you want to take a back seat when somebody tries to correct you. But they help us. Why? Because they show me the blind spots. They have the best interest for me. God is using them as a tool to help me in my spiritual growth. But be careful what kind of accountable partners uh, you want to have. Like, like I just listened on. If somebody says that, uh, if I am an accountable partner to somebody, and what are the qualities I need to be having, and uh, if you are under somebody, you need to check they have these qualities. First, uh, qualities, I've listed on some qualities. And the last one is, is the reason which will keep it last. Many people don't want to have an accountable partner is the last reason. But here are some of the qualities when we choose our accountable partners. Is first thing, choose somebody who gives you wisdom based on biblical principles. Who gives you wisdom based on biblical principles and not personal opinions. Yes? Yes or no? Yes. We don't want personal opinions. We don't want worldly news to us. We've got enough of that. Somebody who gives you wisdom based on biblical principles, but not personal opinions. Second, somebody who's trustworthy, which means they keep confidentiality of the information that you're sharing. No, trustworthy means they maintain confidentiality. No? Somebody that you pour out your life and they maintain the confidentiality that you have shared with them. Third reason is, uh, third characteristic, that quality that you want to look in the person that you want to have accountable partner is, is, is they have a forgiving heart. Like they are, when you make mistakes, their heart, they have a heart that's forgiving and, uh, and uh, they have a spirit of forgiveness. That's what, God does with us, right? Daily, we go to Him. He has a spirit of forgiveness. He does forgive us. No? 
and then fourth, uh, they accept you the way you are and they're willing to help you grow in your Christian walk, right? They accept you the way you are and they're willing to help you grow in your uh, Christian walk. That's what Christ does to me. When I go to Him, He accepts me. His arms are wide open just the way I am and He's willing to help me in my Christian walk. No? Uh, so how many points did we finish? Four. Just want to see if you are awake. Okay. Fifth one. No? Somebody who edifies me. Right? Somebody who edifies me. No? My account with partner should be somebody who edifies me. Like love edifies, the Bible says. Love builds up. It never destroys. Right? Somebody who edifies me, not tears me down, destroys me. Ephesians 4, 29. No? Uh, don't choose somebody who is overly critical and that makes you feel worthless. Yes? Don't choose somebody as your accountable partner who is overly critical and makes you feel worthless. He should be somebody who builds you up. Love builds you up and does not destroy you. It edifies, it builds you up. No? And then, sixth, uh, you should be an encouraging person. No? You don't want somebody like a prophet all the time on your case, right? Who's always keeping a checklist on you, right? Uh, somebody who's constantly judging you and, and acts like a prophet, who's always got a big list writing down and he then throws you one day at you, like, we don't want that, like, not somebody who's like a prophet constantly, because people have enough condemnation, people have enough guilt in them. Uh, we don't want somebody who's like a prophet, like really coming hard on us. How many liked all the six points were edifying, right? So far, I think in your heart, everybody says, I need an accountable partner. Today, Lord, after service, I'm going to look for one. <laughs> no? and, and so far, so good. But I get the last one that might change your mind. The last one for, no, that might change your mind. And this is the reason many people don't want uh, to have an accountable partner is, is the seventh one. Have, have an accountable partner who's courageous, which means if I'm, somebody is, I'm above somebody in one sense as an accountable partner, I need to be courageous, have somebody who's courageous, what does that mean? Which means this person confronts you with truth even when it hurts you, right? This person confronts you with truth even when it hurts you. Ephesians 4.15 says, speak the truth in love, right? Somebody who confronts you, uh, like, uh, like all these are provisions that God gave us. Like we can't say, I can stand alone. I can live my Christian life alone. Like I don't need the word of Christ, body of Christ, accountable partner. We need them. These are provisions that God gave us. And if I say I don't need them, then that's a misplaced confidence. No, you have shifted from the Christ, the Holy Spirit, and the provisions that God gave you as, as a confidence for you, as to lean on, trust on you, and move away from you, from, from the things that God wanted you to do. In 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 1, it says, God actually moved David to number the Israelites. No? And in 1 Chronicles chapter 21, verse 1, it says, Satan was the one who actually the culprit behind numbering the senses. Which one is true? Both are true. It was God actually permitted Satan to tempt David. In one sense, God was upset with the people of Israel and we don't know why he was upset. He wanted to judge them and uh, there's no specific reason why he was upset with the people of Israel. But at the same time, he also knew there was something in David that was not right, maybe a pride in David's life that God wants to put his hand in his heart and stir it up and to bring it to the surface. He said, I need to judge Israel, but I also will bring David's sin to the surface and tell him that this is something not right in your life and uh, that's pride and we'll see that. So God was about to judge Israel. At the same time, he says, while I judge, I will also bring David's sin before him, which is pride. And God did both at one shot and uh, David went and gave the commander 
the charge to go and number the Israelites. Look at it in verse 3. It says, look at Job. Like David had good people around him that could actually tell him. Is this commander now telling and questioning David, why are you doing this? It's good. It's like that courageous, accountable partner who's telling him, why are you numbering the Israelites? No, what's the motive behind it? Look at the verse 3. And Job said to the king, look at these words, read it very carefully. And now Job said to the king, now may the Lord your God add to the people a hundred times more than there are. Look at that. What is Job saying? David, may the Lord God add to the people more than what you have. Who's adding his army? The Lord was army. Lord was the one who was actually adding the army. Who was blessing David? The Lord was blessing. Look at that. May the Lord your God add to the people a hundred times more than there are. He was like trying to bring focus indirectly to David and saying, It's God who is adding and may he add more to you my king. He's saying, and may the eyes of my Lord the king see. See what? See how God is blessing you. But then it says, But why does my Lord the King desire this thing that he wants to number the Israelites? Like he was trying to be a courageous, accountable partner. But at the same time, he knows that King David is above him. But he tells what he has to tell. But doesn't go against him in authority. And then he does, obeys what King says and he goes and counts the army. No, what was wrong with this counting of census? In the, in the Old Testament times, many times the, the, there was a census that happened and God never judged uh, people because of counting census. There are two reasons why census was done. One is for military purpose to count how much strength they have militarily. That's what verse 9 says. That's the reason why the census was carried out. Second reason was to also collect the temple tax to know the census so people can give the taxes to the temple. But, but the reason why David actually counted the census was, was out of pride. He wanted to see how strong he is as a king and how strong his army was and, and to be really proud about himself as a king. That was the motive behind. The second area of misplaced confidence is over the years as God blesses us, like we try to like put our focus on the blessings, on our skills, on our positions, on our promotions and we slowly tend to shift our focus and it's a misplaced confidence. And I'll get into the detail, more in detail, like the very thing that David was trying to take pride in, God cuts that army to size by killing 70,000 men. Isn't that amazing? The very thing that, that, that David was, wow, look at my army. Look at the strength that I have. And David, the very thing, if this thing, this thing is your idol and this thing is the thing that, is, uh, that has become a focus, I will kill and cut them to size and I will go down to the complete and make them zero if you don't repent. And we know that David did repent and God did cut 70,000 men, did destroy his strength by cutting down the army. What was David's fault? David was putting his trust in numbers, right? Like we can show, like over the years when God blesses us, we can. Do you know that historians tell uh, that uh, the spiritual, the spirituality declined, not during the times of adversity, but during the times of prosperity, right? Spirituality declines not during the times of adversity, but during the times of prosperity. That's what historians. Have, have told. He said David was putting his trust in numbers. He was putting his trust in army. He was putting his trust in the might of man. He was putting his trust in how skilled his army is. He was putting his trust in achievements. Look what I have done. He was trying to draw self-glory by counting the senses. He was putting his trust on blessings, on fruit. 
He was putting his trust on horses and chariots in one sense. God again and again said, do not trust in horses and chariots. The whole census, when they counted, they found out the army that could fight, the men that could fight were 1,300,000 1, soldiers were found to be an uh, army that could go to battle at any time after the census was counted. But the Bible says, the Lord was displeased with this census and God judged David for this census. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles chapter 1, verse 12, I give you riches, I give you wealth, I give you honor. Isn't that amazing? That I think cuts us to size in one sense. I give you wealth, I give you honor, I give you riches. Like that, has, we are a vapor before God. God is eternal. He's a big God. How can we ever draw self-glory to ourselves and don't ever think that I'm a Christian for a season. Uh, I know I've been 50 years as a Christian. This happened 38 years after David became king and two years before heading to the grave. Like even the last year of heading to the grave, we should be so cautious that we all can fall into the sin of pride and God does uh, confront such a caution for all us, all of us and, and, and we all can learn from this lesson. There's an old story. I heard this story, maybe some of you heard this, about uh, a frog and two ducks. How many heard this story? Frog. <laughs> Nobody. It's like Sunday school. Two ducks and frog. <laughs> okay. Two ducks and frog. They were good buddies, like every day, like they would play in the pond together, have a lot of fun, a pond filled with water and, and frog and two ducks, what a combination, they were enjoying fun. But during summer times, what happens, the water actually evaporates and, and it gets, pond gets dry. And so the summer season came and there was no water in the pond. So, so this is what uh, the ducks said to the frog, frog we have to move because there's no water here. And the frog said, but how can you guys have wings to fly? <laughs> but what about me? How will I move away? Don't leave me alone. I've got a brilliant idea. And uh, the frog says, uh, uh, the, the duck says, what is the idea? The, uh, the uh, uh, frog says, uh, just uh, both of you can fly. So what you do is uh, take a small branch from the tree and put it in your beaks either side. And while both of you are flying with the branch between your bleaks, I will hold to the, to the branch and as you fly, we all can fly together. You are flying with the beaks, uh, branches on your beaks and I will be in the middle holding to the, to the branch and we can fly to the safe place. You know? And everybody liked the idea and lo and below, behold, the flight took off and they were flying up there. You know? And while they were flying and the frog is frog is hanging in between and the, the beaks of the ducks had the branch and it was hanging in between the frog and uh, lo and behold while there was a farmer in the field he looked at the scene he said wow what a scene look at this two, two ducks flying up oh look at there in between the frog wow what a brilliant idea what a wonderful idea oh wow this has never seen the scene like this before I wonder Whose idea was this? And the frog said with both his hands up, it was my idea. <laughs> and, and, and the frog lo and we all fell down. So, so. <laughs> okay. No, but that's, that's amazing. Like pride goes before destruction. And we all can have this come into our lives. God often in the Bible says, He chose the foolish to put to shame the wise. He chose the weak. And he, that's, that's God's way. God, Christ is our sufficiency. And, and we never rob the glory that belongs to Him. We never become proud with our blessings. So the third area of misplaced confidence is, what is the first one? What is the first one? We never say, I can stand alone. I need the corporate word of God. I need fellowship. I need friends. I need what else? I need the word of God, I need the body of Christ, friends, everybody, accountable partners. Second one is like I never put my confidence in the blessings or the fruit when it comes. 
I don't try to like draw glory to myself. I give always the glory back to God. That's it. Third area of misplaced confidence is, uh, is uh, when we messed up. This is very important. This is, this is something. When we messed up like David, like when we sin, when we fall, when we fail, when we messed up, we went on a wrong track. No? Uh, like uh, uh, we, we, we do mess up, we do make mistakes, we are prone to fall, we are sheep that tend to go astray. Uh, the first thing we do is like confess quickly, repent quickly, keep short accounts. The Bible says when David actually commanded the census to go, when he commanded the census to go, and the Job went to count the census. The whole census operation took 9 months, 20 days. But David did nothing about repentance. He was waiting for the figures to come. He had 9 months, 20 days to repent. But he did nothing. Look at in verse 10. And David's heart condemned him after he had numbered the people. So David said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. But now I pray, O Lord, take away the iniquity of your servant. For I have done very foolishly. Look at David recognized it. He didn't repent for 9 months, 20 days. How much we need? Uh, the conviction of the Holy Spirit. The conviction from the pulpit. And, and, and friends that could tell us. No, 9 months, 20 days. But later he said, Lord, I have done foolish thing. I have made a mistake. What a great sin. Look at this. He's, he terms this sin as great sin because pride is always a great sin uh, that, that the Bible talks about. Pride is always a great sin and for this sin God destroyed 70,000 men uh, of the people and cut his army to size. But I liked David. David fell before God and he said, God, I have sinned. Forgive me. Have mercy upon me. And God gave him three options. Look at those three options. I believe in verse 13, it says, So Gad came to David and told him, and said to him, Shall seven years of famine come to you in your land? Do you want seven years of famine, David? Or shall you flee three months before your enemies while they pursue you? Second option. Third option. Or shall there be three days plague in your land? Now consider and see what answer I should take back to him who sent me. Like options were given to David. But look at David said to God in verse 14, I am in great distress. Please let us fall into the hand of the Lord, for His mercies are great. But do not let me fall into the hand of the Lord. I like that. Even when we mess, we make mistakes, we can go back to God, right? Like David did. David said, Lord, I have sinned. I have failed. How can I do? This is a great sin. And I have failed miserably. How could I even do this and try to rob your glory? Lord, you gave me three options. Whatever options you gave, it, keep it aside. But I don't think there's a better option than to fall at the mercies of God. For your mercies are great. That's amazing. God's mercies are great. No? And I like it. Today, Pastor Atul said, I know, right? Like God knows our weaknesses. I know, I fear and faithful. I know, I know your weaknesses. I know the tendencies of the sheep to go astray. I know it all. And, and God says, I know David. Repent. And the angel was proceeding for the 70,000 men. And he was ready to cut down to size his army. And God said to the angel, stop it. He is repented. He has confessed his sin. No more judgment. And God says, Stop it. And great are your mercies, O Lord. I know. Like I know. He said, like I love that. When he said, I was thinking about this. I know. Our high priest. We have an high priest. Who knows? No? Who knows our infirmities? Who knows our weaknesses? Who knows our troubles? We have an high priest that knows and that can sympathize with our troubles today. And with our frailties and weaknesses. I know, I know, I, I know I have a high priest who knows and who can identify with my trouble. Because that is what, you know what Satan does when we fall? He wants us to stay on the ground. Right? He doesn't want us to rise up. 
because he wants to mock at us, laugh at us. He wants us to stay on the ground. And Micah verse, chapter 7, verse 8 and 9 says, Do not rejoice over me, mine enemy. Though I have fallen, I will rise. Though I sit in darkness, the Lord will be my light. Right? Like, like the enemy is rejoicing and he wants me to stay on the ground. Maybe sin has disobedience and sin has pinned me to the ground. And the devil is rejoicing while I'm on the ground. There's a God in heaven. David said, great are his mercies. And he can lift me up and provide mercy. In closing, look at Psalm. Last one minute I'm done. This Psalm and then we are done. Psalm 136. It says, verse 1 and 3. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Right? Let's give thanks to the Lord. For he is good God. Our God is good. Give him thanks. And then it says, For his mercy endures forever. His mercy endures forever. Give him thanks. Oh, give thanks to the God of gods. For his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords. For his mercy endures forever. And the last fourth one, I like this closing verse. To him who alone does great wonders. Who does great wonders? Our God alone does wonders for His mercy endures forever. Who alone does wonders? Like David you sinned but you know God does wonders. He can bring you back. No? He can forgive your sin. He can use you again. He can have judgment stop over you. And, uh, and, and, and I like that. For He alone and Christ alone can do wonders in our life. Even when the sheep go astray, it's Christ who can actually bring them on track. And it's a wondrous work. And He alone can do wonders. Amen? Amen. And I like that. Three misplaced confidences. What is that? Self. Trusting in self is a misplaced confidence. Then, trusting in my blessings is a misplaced confidence. Third is when I messed up, trying to handle my mess on my own is a misplaced confidence. David said, I will fall at the mercies of Christ. Amen? Amen. So Father, we thank you for this word. And Lord, this morning, uh, we believe that you minister to many of us. In whatever area, Lord, you spoke to us, we pray that this word would bear fruit unto your glory. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. With every head bow, with every eye closed, if you are here this morning, and uh, if you have never accepted Christ as your personal Savior, we would like to invite you to the simple truth. With every head bow, eye closed. Uh, if you have never known about Jesus, the Bible says Jesus is God. He came down to this earth to die for sinners. And uh, he shed his blood on the cross and, uh, and uh, he loves you. The reason he came and died was to demonstrate his love. If you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, we encourage you to do this today. Because he loves you. Death is certain. The wages of sin is death. Uh, and uh, once we leave this earth, uh, if you would like to be in heaven, then uh, Christ shed the blood for you. Just have to receive Him as your personal Savior. And if you are this morning here and would like to receive Christ as your personal Savior, just say this simple prayer. Just say, Father, I repent of my sin. I confess my sins. I am a sinner. Thank you for sending Jesus into this world to die on my behalf. I learned today that I cannot go to heaven on my own. That's why I trust in Christ as my Savior. Forgive me of all my sins. Take me to heaven when I leave earth. I pray this prayer. And I really mean this prayer in Jesus' name. With every head bow, if you said that prayer, just raise your hand for a minute. Okay. Anyone that said that prayer, raise your hand. Okay. Amen. Let's stand and worship God.
tribulation. It's going to pour uh, tribulation, a lot of pressure on the, on the people in Smyrna. David's two great sins, both of them, he's at the height of his power. One with Bathsheba, he's at the height of his powers. And this one at the height of his powers. At both times he falls. I just won't picture to do this with Pastor Shala. He used to always say to us, when you think you're secure, like when you're standing like this, he says it's your weakest. And he'd always say, when you're like this, he says it's that's when you're more safe than ever. Because you and we don't like it, we don't like tribulation, we don't like the heavy pressure, but he says that's when you're much more secure. But when you when you get into into this this way, then 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 you are much more than him who thinks he stands that he that he, that he that does not fall. Lord, thank you, thank you, Father, for a, a wonderful church, Lord, wonderful works of mercy, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Bless our week ahead, Father, as we look forward, Father, to conference coming the following week, Lord. Pray your blessing in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.